Welcome to the Wireless Village. I have the pleasure of, for the second time this weekend, introducing my good friend who will remain nameless because for those of you who haven't had a chance to see him yet, I want you all to, to get a fine picture in your head of what a wonderful man this is. This man's been, uh, well, we worked together for quite a while and that was a lot of fun and then he left me to start his own project and nobody had actually seen him for a while and when I say nobody had seen him for a while, I mean for some reason you just never saw him. But what you did get was his wonderful voice. So without further ado, I'd like to have you all close your eyes so that you don't get confused. I'd like to hear his famous catchphrase that he has at all of the beginnings of his videos. Hello all, welcome to securitytube.net. <laughs> <laughs> and how do you miss that? Give this man a big hand. Thanks for coming. Thanks, <laughs> Thanks for that great introduction, Rick. <laughs> Okay, uh, so in this session, we're going to be looking at how to script your own Wi-Fi attack tools with Python. Uh, how many of you have scripted your own tools in any language? Wireless, okay. Uh, Python? Ruby? Perl? Couple? Okay. All the Perl guys are hesitating to raise their hands. <laughs> uh, so I've been doing a lot of wireless security for probably the last 15 years. Uh, and being able to script quick proof of concepts always comes in handy. Now, when you look at wireless scripting, uh, there are really two ways by which you can get packets from the network. One is using raw sockets, which is probably the absolute low level way uh, of talking to your operating system telling it to go ahead and give you the packets. The second slightly more abstracted way would be to use something like Scapy, Lippy Cap, or some other wrapper uh, which works around all the low-level details of a raw socket. So how many of you have ever created your own SSID sniffer with a raw socket or used raw sockets at all? Okay. Uh, so let me show you how it looks like. Okay. Uh, so this is a raw socket based SSID sniffer in roughly 20 lines of Python. This does not use any external library. Now, initially, I mean, there's an interesting story behind why I created this piece of code. Uh, initially, I had actually created a much more simplified one, roughly the same number of lines using Scapy, right? After that, I posted this on Reddit programming. And all the programmers started flaming me. Because they were like, you use Scapy, right? That isn't allowed. I mean, if you have to do it, you have to do it using just raw sockets. So that's when I created the alternate version, uh, which just uses raw sockets. Now, how does this work? It opens a raw socket. And then we bind it to an interface, assuming mon0. Unfortunately, we have to change that to a WLAN X mon now, if you use one of the latest versions. It's not unfortunate. Go away. Is it? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's because I think that change was brought about by Zero Chaos's Airmon NG ZC, right? It's, it's less confusing. You know yeah. what interface is well. <laughs> That kind of required me to change almost all my scripts, which I probably wrote over the last eight years. So everything crashes for the first time now. Uh, so here is an example of how you can do that. Uh, what we do after that is basically just receive from the interface and check if this is an 802.11 packet. And after that, pick up the SSID length from the exact location and check if it is an null SSID or not. I mean, we aren't going to be using this to learn using Python. This is just an example that you could write your own SSID sniffer in Python in just so many lines. Uh, the only place where I see a good application of this is on an embedded device. So if you have an open WRT-based router where you're trying to go ahead, sniff the air, 
you probably want to use this rather than scapy uh, unfortunately scapy seems to hold most of the packets in memory and embedded devices don't have that much amount of memory so all your scapy based scripts end up crashing on your open wrt systems if they run for a long time uh, let me show you how this looks like So my wireless interface is WLAN 3. I'm just going to go in to an Airmon NG start WLAN 3. And then I'm going to change the interface to WLAN 3 mon. You could even take it as an input if you wanted. Let's actually take it as an input. Now the very first demo always crashes. So I'm just going to use a channel hopper uh, in the background. Okay, this is bad. Just give me a second. Okay. I'll just get back to this. Unusually, I mean, this is the first time this has ever bailed out on me. So it's probably just bad luck. Uh, I'll just come back. I'll definitely kind of make this run. What a horrible way to start. Uh, what I really wanted to talk today about how, is how to automate WPA-based attacks. How many of you have used WPA CLI? Anyone? Okay. So... The de facto network management utility is WPA supplicant on Linux-based machines. Now, interestingly, WPA supplicant allows what is called a control interface through which you can control it at runtime. So you can actually change parameters, make it do interesting stuff while it is running. So once you connect your client card, typically your network manager uh, would go ahead and start it. And actually look at where run okay just a second guys I think I'll just do a quick reboot uh, I know what is wrong I actually killed many of the network management utilities that's the reason why uh, so how is this going to work basically WLAN uh, the WPA supplicant Basic exposes a control interface. In the meantime, I can actually show you what the control interface looks like. Okay, so WPA supplicant uh, basically has a control interface, and that control interface is actually what is used by our network manager. 
So internally, WPA supplicant exposes all of these different interfaces to you. The one we are going to use is what they call the control IF. Now, the control IF is actually a C-based API. And we are going to be using a Python wrapper to go ahead and talk to that and control WPA supplicant. Now, what does the control interface allow us to do? Uh, it actually allows us to run a bunch of commands. For example, ping, looking at the MIB, the status. So let's say if you're connected to a WPA network, or for that matter, any network using WPA supplicant, you can monitor the status on a separate terminal. You can even look at things like the different key caches, you can set variables, do log on, log off. So every single thing you could actually do with the WPA supplicant config file, you can actually control that at runtime using the WPA supplicant control interface. So let me quickly log in. The demo gods aren't with me today. This is my fifth talk at DEF CON. I did two main stage and I think one village talk and one is tomorrow, but this seems to probably be it. It's about time statistics caught up with me. So something has to go wrong. Okay, we'll see, it should run. Uh, interestingly, WPA supplicant also has a very low level API called the DBUS API. This is used by a ton of GUI programs to go ahead and basically emulate what is Linux's COM, right? If you've used Windows COM, uh, think of this as COM on Linux. So this allows different programs to talk to each other using a D bus. Uh, this is really a virtual bus over which programs can send message to each other. So you can have subscribers, consumers, uh, you can publish your APIs, so WPA supplicant actually publishes its own API, which you can access over the DBus. So you could send it command, poll, what is the current events happening and things like that. Okay. Now, as soon as you run your machine, your network manager automatically will start WPA supplicant if you have a wireless card. If WPA supplicant is configured to run its control interface, you should actually find it in var run WPA supplicant. Interestingly, the control interface file has the exact same name as the interface, right? WLAN 3 in this case. Now, anytime you need to go ahead and talk to the existing running version of WPA supplicant, you actually use the control interface. So let's look at some very simple examples. Now, the best way to learn the control interface is to use a utility called WPA CLI. Has anyone used it? Okay, this is like one of the little hidden gems. I mean, if you use WPA CLI, you can automatically figure out the entire control interface. So if you run WPA CLI without any arguments, it'll automatically go inside the var run WPA supplicant directory, figure out the control interface file, and in a way attach to it. So now it can monitor and look at what is happening on your current running instance of WPA supplicant. So if you notice, we just got two events here which said control event scan result WPS AP available, right? So you could actually write your own error dump in G uh, just by going ahead and invoking WPS CLI with scan results. And there you go. You have a ton of information about everything 
WPA supplicant and in turn your network manager sees. It also tells you which of the APs are WPS enabled. I don't know if Aerodum supports this at this point. Is Thomas here? No. I haven't seen WPS being tagged anywhere. And this does not require any special cards. If, if you have a functional Linux system with a wireless card on it which works, you can run WPS CLI on it. This does not require an Athros card or an Alpha card or any special hardware. Right? It will just work out of the box. Now, there are tons of different commands you can actually use with WPA CLI. Probably the easiest way to get started with WPA supplicant, which can be very confusing if you look at what is available in the config. Now, let's try and look at uh, if we can automate some of these things, right? So you could play with WPA sub CLI later on. It's completely command line, ton of help out there. And all you have to do is to configure a network as an example, you'll use add network. It actually returns an ID to you. And then you go ahead and, you know, uh, add the network configs and all of that. It's a great tool if you want to configure, but this talk is about automation. So I'm not going to talk about how to use WPA CLI, right? But definitely have a look at it. Now, let's look at how we can control WPA supplicant using the WPA control APIs. Okay, let's wait for it. <laughs> Something's wrong. <laughs> Someone's watching over me. <laughs> Okay, so and I'm trying my best not even to you know, move a muscle on this side so that probably the cable doesn't get uh, you know, it'll shaken up in any way. But I, uh, now, interestingly, there is only one Python uh, extension available for WPA control called PyWPA control. You can actually go to GitHub. And originally, the author of WPA Supplicant had published this with some demo code in there. Unfortunately, he didn't maintain it. So PI WPA CTRL is the one which is updated with some small patching here and there. So remember to download that. Uh, once you do that, you basically have the power of Python to control your WPA Supplicant interface. So I'm going to open up another tab. and just start WPA CLI on this. Interestingly, you can have multiple agents polling the same control interface and even sending receiving commands, right? So we'll use WPA CLI just to look at the kind of events which are happening in the background. Just so that you don't have to watch me type in stuff. Uh, Using WPA control is actually quite easy. All we have to do is import WPA control as expected. Now, once you do that, you need to tell WPA control where the control interface exists, which is var run WPA supplicant WLAN 3 in our case. So we're going to go ahead and define that as the control interface. All of the sample source code will be available for download. At the end, I'll give you a URL and you can download it. Now, after this, you can actually tell WPA control to open and get a handle to this control interface. Right? This is done with very simply WPA CTRL dot WPA control, give it the path to the control interface. Now, once you do that, uh, you can actually go ahead and ping the interface. And if everything works fine, you should get back a, anyone? If you ping it, what do you get back? A pong, right? 
So that's basically their own internal quick heartbeat test mechanism. So you can ping it just to ensure that, hey, do I have a stable connection? Is the control interface still running? And all of the commands which we talked about here can actually be sent over the WPA CTRL interface. I mean, it's just fantastic. Uh, total hidden gems in here. I mean, you can actually automate live attacks and a ton of stuff. Now, interestingly, with just a couple of lines of Python, uh, you can actually control WPA supplicant and tell it to scan the network. So before we do that, you can look at the status of the interface by just using status. And right now it says, hey, it's inactive, not connected really to anything. And it just gives you a MAC address. Now we can request a scan. Now keep in mind, your network manager is already talking to WPA supplicant and requesting it to scan the air probably once every minute. Uh, one of the ways you can stop that is kill the network manager or stop it, and then you start your own instance of WPA supplicant with the right config option so that the control interface is available, right? Then you might not have the network manager interfering. So a lot of times when you actually try to run a scan, you might actually get an error busy. Right now it says okay, which is great. And if we go back here, let's try scanning once again. So we are requesting a scan. And a couple of seconds later, you'll actually see scan results available. So this is the WPA CLI interface, which is also monitoring for all the live events which WPA supplicant is publishing on its control interface. So the moment we have scan results, and that's something you can monitor in Python as well, uh, you could very simply go back and pretty much write your own version of arrow dump. <laughs> there you go. Isn't that great? <laughs> and and you could just run this in a loop, uh, you know, time it once every couple of seconds and then you can get all the results. Interestingly, if the network manager is running, you do not even have to do anything. It'll automatically scan periodically. Uh, there are also event-based mechanisms where you can be told when a scan is complete. So people who've programmed like a callback, right? So that you receive a callback and you can only handle events when they happen rather than having to poll for events continuously. Now, here is one quick, word of caution is if you run scans successively really quickly, you're actually going to get fail busies. Now all of these scan requests are actually getting cached. So after some time, you'll actually have WPA supplicant quickly process them one after the other. Now this is something you would need to handle in your code and you'll actually see the error busy quite a lot or the fail busy quite a lot. Sometimes it's probably channel hopping, still collecting stuff. So you cannot time it. You can't say, okay, after five seconds, I can be sure the scan results are available. You can't do that. One mechanism is if you poll, you have to check for the return value. The other is where you subscribe and wait for the right event. Right, we'll talk about the event-based mechanism a little later. Now, WPA CLI actually has like a ton of commands in there. Uh, let me see if I can pick something up. I'll share this document as well. This is uh, a draft of one of the chapters I was writing for our next book. But WPA CLI, if I just quickly scroll down, just show you the relevant part before we can move on to other interesting things.
So you can actually configure WPA, PSK, WPA2, PSK, enterprise networks and all of that using WPA CLI. So here is an example, you know, scroll up. Here is an example of how to configure a WPA PSK network using WPA CLI. So we first do an add network. This returns an ID and we need to use that ID now to reference that network configuration every time we talk to WPA CLI. So after that, we are going to be going to go ahead and change, for example, the SSID, uh, the way you'd like to scan. So WPA supplicant even allows you to decide whether you would like to send things like null probe requests or just silently wait for beacons. All of that can be configured. Now in the case of PSK, auth is going to be open. It's WPA PSK. We're using TKIP. And then finally, we use PSK. This is a demo 123. Mode defines whether this is infrastructure or independent BSS. And very similarly, you could actually go ahead and configure uh, WPA2, PSK, and Enterprise as well. So I'd highly recommend using and looking at WPA CLI. As I said, it's the best way to learn stuff. Now, let's actually look at some serious scripting, which we can do. So event monitoring, here's a simple example of how to monitor events, really very simple. Uh, all you have to do is call attach and after that you can just wait receiving for events. So WPA.receive is a blocking call. So anytime a new event is available, you get woken up. Now if you're thinking, what about individual events? Can I just subscribe to a scan result event? Uh, well, the control interface does not support that directly. You probably have to write your own wrapper around it and then call whatever code you want depending on what event you've received. Now, one of the things I'd always wanted to do is write a live a WPA PSK attack tool. I mean, there is nothing more than an academic value to that. Now, here is what I mean by that. Uh, Let's take a word list. How do we crack WPA or WPA2 PSK right now? Can anyone just explain while I connect everything? Okay. Uh, what if there is no client around? Yeah. What if you're an impatient person? <laughs> so, uh, one of the interesting things which you can look at, and this actually applies to a lot of uh, stuff. Is what if, I mean, again, there isn't much of practical value to this, but the best part is you can still do it. What if we could actually take pass phrases out of a word list and try and check every single passphrase against the access point live. Now, when you look at something like an Air Replay NG or many of these tools, uh, they are stateless, which is most of them operate typically with the single packet principle, right? You send a dauth, you forget about it. You keep sending dauths. Uh, doing a fake authentication actually is easy. It's just a probe request response and the ASOC stuff. Trying to verify a WPA passphrase live against an AP is non-trivial. You actually need to have the entire WPA stack available, including things like looking at the four-way handshake, uh, checking you know the different nonces, creating your PTK, and then finally verifying that against the MIC, right? Uh, which is like a signature over some of the four-way handshake packets. Only then do we actually know that, hey, the AP and I, both of us have the same passphrase. Now, how do you do something like that if you wanted to? And actually, this attack and automation doesn't just apply to WPA PSK. Anytime 
you actually want a full network stack available to you and where you'd like to try different attacks uh you would probably have to use the control interface of wpa supplicant or host apd right host apd also has a control interface so how do we do that okay so i've i'm going to show you what this script does in just a bit uh so it's a wpa psk live cracker and what it does is it goes through a dictionary picks up individual pass phrases and tries it against the access point live yeah right the the reason i did not mention the ssid and all of that yet is i know the ctf guys would immediately like go ahead and send dots and stop uh, you know this from working so now i can go back to the script and show you how this works uh, the same template can be used for any stateful attack so let's say you would like to create an access point on demand and you know an mitm setup you could go ahead use the control interface for host apd accordingly uh, how does the code look like all of these python scripts would be shared after the class so you can run it yourself later on now if you recall i'd shown you wpa cli's config on how you can go ahead and create a network and set different parameters for that network right so we are going to be using wpa controls api to simulate all of those steps but inside our own code So for every single passphrase in our word list we go ahead create the appropriate network setting and then we tell wpa supplicant to actually run and try and connect to that so if i were to monitor wpa supplicant while this attack is going on uh it probably really appreciate what is happening in the background and why it is so heavyweight that you need a full blown stack so i'm running this and actually start seeing trace backs on wpa supplicant if you notice it's trying to authenticate associated right this is wpa supplicant trying to do the four way handshake and there you go the first attempt the four way handshake failed do you see that right and it basically disconnects then i give it the next pass phrase and then it goes back and tries again the second one right now is right on the list so finally key negotiation succeeds and we are able to connect to the network so by monitoring all of these state changes you can actually write your own stateful tools which probably can launch more sophisticated attacks after connections here is another simple example let's say you want to check every single open ssid and verify which one has free internet access on it right how do you do that right now if i told you to write a script connect to every network right and tell me if this has an internet available without maybe uh you know any form of captive portal on it or if it has a captive portal then maybe capturing the captive portal page and storing it somewhere right so you could use the exact same process all that would differ here is we would first scan the air do you recall when we called scan results when we did the whole wpa ctrl scan and then we got the scan results and for every ap in the scan result we go ahead try and connect to it based on the security parameters which we see which is of course in this case it's open does not have any form of encryption once that is the case we try and connect to that access point and see if that succeeds wpa supplicant will raise the event and then you can actually even call the dhcp client on that interface actually could even have it running and then you can check if you're able to access servers and things like that so this is just an easy example really anything which requires you to do stateful things now if i were to go back uh just to look at the complicated part of the script 
Now, all of this looks quite simple and you don't have to do all the commands again and again. All you have to change is just the pass phrase every single time. So I'm going through the word list and for every pass phrase, all I do is set the pass phrase and then select and enable this network. When we do that and send this command to WPA supplicant over the control interface, WPA supplicant immediately starts picking up the configuration you created and tries to connect. Now, all of the problems which I faced initially, I mean, I actually thought this would just be 20 lines of code. That's it. But when I started working with it, do you recall all those fail busy, fail? Those events seem to be happening more often than probably I realized. So what I had to do is any time I run a command, I actually have a wrapper on top of it. So this wrapper will actually automatically try to run that command for up to five times the command failing, right? So it tries the command, gets back a failure, says, okay, let's wait for maybe, you know, a second or two. Let's try it once again. So this seems to be the only way and which I finally figured a lot of people were using as well, uh, including you would actually find not exactly this, but something similar in Android's WPA supplicant Python code as well. So literally all your uh, Linux and POSIX systems which use WPA supplicant, including Android, actually automates most of the connection for the network manager using this exact control interface, right? There is no other choice, really. I mean, the only other choice is you have a fixed config file which you start WPA supplicant with. While a network manager needs the flexibility to be able to change the network based on what the user selects. So this was one of the things I had to write. Uh, it's actually very simple. You know, all I do is a while one and I go ahead, keep trying, uh, catch the exception, people who've used Python. If you haven't, every language pretty much has something similar to this. And I just go ahead and try up to maximum retries. Uh, this actually works quite well. Let me actually delete uh, the right passphrase from the word list. And if you go back here, you should be able to see the entire trace back. Now, one of the other things I also managed to do after this is actually fire other automated tools. So as an example, let's say you want some kind of an automated scan to run after connection. So you could control WPA supplicant, connect to the network, and once you get a DHCP address, you can then launch Nmap and all of those automatically, right? So a lot of automation across not just Wi-Fi, but layers above it, can actually happen with this script as a starting point. I've tried brute forcing for up to 5,000. Of course, it takes an astronomical time. As I said, the whole purpose of a WPA PSK cracking live is more academic and just to illustrate the fact that you can do this without having to write your own network stack of any kind. Uh, but it is actually quite stable. Uh, the only flaky part was getting the okay busy and the okay errors from time to time. And if you handle that with a wrapper, it's actually quite stable. Any, any questions with respect to the control interface? I mean, this is just one example of what you can do. I mean, it's up to your creativity and you know, the task at hand, but any questions so far? Control interface? Yeah. Uh, if you have multiple cards, so here's the thing, right? Because in a way, WPA supplicant has a true stack, not a simulated one using raw sockets. So if you look at things like Airbase NG, they sniff packets just using raw sockets. So you could actually run multiple instances of Airbase NG and one instance wouldn't interfere with the other because there is no true network stack attached. But WPA supplicant actually has a stack and unfortunately, because of that, you can only run one instance on one card. You could run 
multiple instances, but you need multiple cards for that. Uh, what is the other way you can automate is by doing everything in raw sockets, right? But that is actually very, very painful given the fact that the WPA four-way handshake and everything which follows after that, including the group key management and the GTKs and all of that, uh, is something which is quite difficult to emulate if you just wanted to do it in you know, your own fake AP software. But yes, you could. That would be one of the ways to do it. Question? Okay. Okay. Now, one of the other things is uh, something actually even more sophisticated. Just going to uh, keep this simple. All the code examples are available. Uh, probably take a couple of hours to go through what Dbus is, but at a very high level. A lot of programs use what is called the D-Bus, which can be a system D-Bus or only on a per application basis. Uh, think of this as a message queue at a very high level, right? So I can go ahead and say, okay, me WPS supplicant can go ahead and receive or send messages on the D-Bus and anyone who like to control me or probably go ahead and read data from what I'm doing can subscribe to the same dbus. Uh, this isn't restricted to WPA supplicant. Actually, a lot of software does this on POSIX based systems. So here is an example. Uh, and this, this code can be a little intimidating, but actually it is quite simple of how you can automate a WPA enterprise attack using dbus. I'll just explain what it is. Uh, so let's say in the case of PEEP or EAP TTLS, you probably want to try different iterations of usernames and passwords, just as one other example, right? So in this case, we could again use the WPA control interface, which we just looked at. What is the downside with the control interface? The responses which you receive are all text-based. So you have to do the text parsing. Most of them are just separated by new lines. So every line is separated by a new line. The D-Bus gives you a pure data structure, right? So that you can actually work with data structures and objects directly rather than having to use text and maybe try to convert it to whatever compatible object your program requires. So at the very top, what we do is we mention the different D-Bus parameters. Uh, this typically would tell the application where the dbus path interface and all of that is now wpa supplicant has all of this very well defined in its documentation right so they have a huge documentation for the dbus api uh, ideally most of the implementations which i've seen of the dbus for supplicant is all c code your network manager for example actually uses the dbus api now the dbus api uh, provides you most of the interfaces the control one does but as i said now you get back objects if i go back to the code now most of the process is exactly similar you would just have to do it in the dbus way right so that you can set up you know who you want to send messages to call the appropriate interfaces and all of that stuff all this code is going to be available for free uh, personally i haven't seen much of this code being around anywhere so it kind of took me some time to write it uh, because the documentation around this is poor the only good places i could find something uh, was android's document uh, not documentation really android's code for its network manager which also uses dbus and a couple of other things So with this, you can actually have kind of given scripts here. Uh, you can automate scans. So here is an example of me scanning with Dbus. Now it almost kills you given the fact that the last time we scanned, we just basically sent scan and we just printed it, right? And everybody clapped. I'm sure when I run this, nobody will. 
So you could actually go ahead, start the scan. Let me show you how the scan looks like uh, using the DBus interface. So you need to know the interface ID and run scan WLAN 3. Now, the best part of using DBus is, as I said, everything you receive is objects. So you can actually parse all of these individual parameters uh, very nicely and kind of reuse them in your program. Right? I've parsed some of them, you can parse the rest. Some of them are still placeholders. So you could run the scan, get the list of APs, look at interesting ones, and now launch another module to do an automated attack. Uh, the WPA supplicant interface is the only one available right now to actually do very complicated stateful attacks on Wi-Fi. Right? Uh, I haven't seen anything else. Any any questions with respect to the DBus? I mean, I'd probably take at least a day to go through the DBus API if, if I were to teach it in a class. So just want to keep it high level and so that people can download and try the code rather than me explaining every aspect of it. Questions? Okay. Uh, apart from this, of course, you also have some of the other code which we are giving out. Scapey, anyone? Scapey? Yay, right? Okay. Yeah, so uh, a ton of Scapey code. A uh, couple of the interesting ones, including things like monitoring probe requests through Scapey. Uh, you can try it. I mean, compared to using the WPA control and the DBus API, I think Scapey is Python 101. So, I mean, it's super easy to use Scapey. There, there isn't much to it at all. Per se, so I'm not going to run scapey code. Uh, this zip file should be available at pentesteracademy.com slash Wi-Fi village in the next one hour. I couldn't make my VPN work. I wonder why. Uh, so as soon as I get it working, it should be there. pentesteracademy.com slash Wi-Fi village. Let me kind of write that out for you. Uh, you can download all the code. You can email me in case you're having any issues with the code or uh, if there is any other interesting aspect of it which you want to know. Uh, any other questions, queries about programming your own kind of wireless attack tool, which is stateful? Uh, all the dauth and all that is actually quite easy to write. I mean, you could write it with scapy, you could do it in raw sockets. Most of them are just single packet or at most a couple of packets. Those are quite easy to write and maintain. Even the fake auth, I'd actually recommend using Scapy. Uh, Scapy has a couple of functions where it can actually wait for the response, where it understands that if I send out a probe request, I'm looking for a response. Or if I send out an SOC request, I'm looking for a response. So I'd recommend Scapy up to fake auth. Beyond that, if you want to do anything stateful, which is stable, you probably look no further than the WPA control APIs. Uh, extremely stable code, very well written. You know, being a C programmer, I actually looked at the code and, I mean, you know, it's way better than what I could probably ever write. Uh, been around probably for the last 15 years, so it's a fantastic code base. Every POSIX system uses WPA supplicant and host APD. By the way, they haven't published the interface for host APD, but you can tap into similar stuff and work with it as well by creating fake APs. Why is why is it better to use host APD over something like uh, Airbase NG? Anyone? What is the what is the difference, and where is it important uh, to realize that difference? How many of you have used Airbase? How many of you have never created a fake AP? Okay, call people. So people who have used Airbase, uh, you know, could we use Airbase if you wanted to do WP Enterprise? WP Enterprise honeypots. If you wanted to create a WPA2 PEEP or a TTLS-based honeypot uh, where you also have a backend radius server. Actually, we did a bunch of demos yesterday in the last class we took, but... Maybe some of you weren't here, so could we do that with Airbase? No. Why? Uh, because Airbase was in Windows mode, so you must do, uh, to implement all by stack in the um, Airbase Windows mode. 
but if we work in monitor mode, we get all packets. So Airbase could actually pick up all the packets and do the needful, right? I mean, you're close, but not close enough. Go ahead. Give it a try. Uh, okay, you're close. Uh, let me give the answer. So basically, what Airbase cannot do is low-level EAP packet redirection. Right? So when we look at WPA Enterprise... All the initial network logon over 802.1x happens using EAP. I mean, EAP isn't IP. EAP is a protocol by itself. So Airbase doesn't understand EAP. And Airbase doesn't work, uh, right now at least, and it cannot redirect EAP packets to the radius server. Yeah. Host APD can. Yeah, I mean, you could... Modify any tool if you added the support, but right now there isn't any support, is what I mean. Yeah, I mean, you could modify any source code to add any support you like, but as of this point, there isn't, right? I mean, it isn't a limitation of it conceptually. It's a limitation in the sense of not being implemented, right? Uh, any questions? Any other questions? So you can download this code in maybe an hour's time. The link should be up. And if you have any questions about programming or automation with Python. Uh, we did the very first Python for pen testers course online in the world. So uh, we love Python. So if there's anything, just send us an email. Thank you.